morning, everyone. Nowadays, it's very hard to do anything without our technical support people. And I just want to thank people here and also people at Sutherland Church to make this possibility um, that we can actually have one combined service from multiple locations. And I note that um, there are people at the church, at Sutherland um, Church as well, and that's good uh, that people at least can come together physically. Um, but there are still others who are joining online, and it's wonderful to be together in this way. Well, let's bow our heads and pray before we get into the Word of God. Our Father, we thank you for all your provision. Your thing, we thank you for your wonderful grace, your mercy, um, and not only your wonderful mercy of forgiveness and salvation, but also we thank you for all the other things that you provide upon our lives. And without your provision, we cannot go on even for a single day. We acknowledge that and we thank you for your sustaining grace. And this morning as we come before your words, we pray also um, that your grace, especially um, through your teaching and fellowship, will flow onto our lives and pray that we'll be nourished in our souls so we can live our life uh, in this world for our eternal future. So we commit this to you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've read the Bible then you'll be very familiar with the story that we have just read from Luke chapter 18. It's the parable of the Pharisee and a tax collector who come up to the temple to pray. But as the saying goes, familiarity can breed contempt, which simply means that if you're too familiar with the story, you can easily miss the point. So it is important for us to regularly approach texts such as this with fresh mind. Try to get rid of all your unconscious bias uh, and even some preconceptions that may not be very helpful and look at the story for what it is and try to see what the Lord wants to teach us. In fact, there are many perspectives when it comes to especially interpreting parables. Some people approach parables from um, their own agenda, their own perspective. Um, they may have some outcome that they want to achieve and use certain parables in order to achieve their outcome. But really, we have to look at the story and see what the Lord Jesus wants to teach us. We need to look at the original intent of the message and also look at the intended meaning that is um, communicated by the writer or the speaker from the story to the original audience as much as we can. So we begin with verse 9. Look at verse 9, and this sets the stage. He says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. That's the reason. The reason why Jesus is telling this parable is to speak to the people who thought they were righteous, who thought they were superior, who thought they were better people than other people, and therefore judged or looked down upon everyone else. Now let's pause there for a moment and think about the story and the intent of this story. In fact, if you look at the word some in verse 9, the word some can be translated into any. Um, it's a very simple word in Greek. Um, but it can be translated into basically anyone. So we can read, to anyone who were confident, who thought that they were confident in their own righteousness. This is how we can read. Which means that this is not only particularly applicable for those people who are there, Pharisees and those people who are proud, but this applies to people even in our time. In other words, this applies to everyone. Everyone. Besides, when Jesus was telling this parable to the people, it was not just the Pharisees, but there were multitudes who came to hear the story as well. And not only that, in fact, um, when it says to some who or to any were confident of their own righteousness, we also remember that, uh, that we can be righteous, self-righteous. No, let, let me correct that. We can be self-righteous in our own eyes. We can be confident. And we can also be proud. In fact, think about your own experience. Was there or has there been any time when you looked at someone else with a judgmental uh, attitude? Have you ever kind of 
thought within your heart, within your mind, or you know, he's such and such a person and, and she's such and such a person, and you come to your own self-judgment, which may not be always accurate. We have to remember that we are all proud, and we have all made judgments on other people, and we've all looked down upon others and thought that we were somewhat better than them. And it is so easy to fall into that sin of self-pride and self-righteousness and look down upon other people. So let's remember that this is a story that Jesus told and written down by Luke for our benefit as well. So don't think that this is someone else's story or story that's intended for some other people, but this is for us and this is for me. And when you look at a story also, we can just look at um, the story uh, in its context. We look at the historical context, we look at grammatical context, and simply understand the meaning of the story. And once we've done that, we can go on to applications, implications, and all the other things. So when you look at the story, Jesus is teaching them this parable. Now what is a parable? A parable comes from a word uh, that begins with para, parallel. So this is another story that can teach some lessons to people in uh, a different context. Um, basically, there are people here, and some of them are Pharisees, but some of them are not Pharisees, but yet Jesus was telling the story so that the lessons from this par parable can be applicable to the people who are listening to the story. It's a kind of illustration, it's a fictitious story, but nonetheless, it is very real, realistic, and it's something that people can relate to very easily. And that's why Jesus often used very easy to understand examples uh, from uh, agriculture sometimes, from everyday life events and occurrences, and people that they encounter every day to tell stories like this. There was actually a moment in Jesus' ministry, about halfway through, when Jesus began teaching in parables, in fact. And so much so that he did not teach except he used parables from that point, on, point onwards. And we find that in Matthew chapter 13. And that chapter uh, contains seven or eight parables uh, in just one chapter alone. And from that time, about halfway through Jesus' ministry in Galilee, Jesus is telling basically everything in parables. And there are reasons why he spoke in parables. One was to conceal the truth, in a sense. It's like a coded message. So Jesus told the parable, and sometimes people would get it. Sometimes they wouldn't get it. And the disciples would come and ask Jesus, what, what did you mean when you told the parable? And Jesus would explain the meaning of the parable to only a selected few people, to the disciples and maybe a little bit more people, but not the whole crowd. So Jesus actually kind of coded his message in these parables. And there were also some parables that were just outright um, sarcasm. Um, Jesus was telling the parables in order to indict, especially the Jewish religious people there, um, so that you know, they got the message and they became so angry and furious about what Jesus had simply said um, in, in the parable. So Jesus used parables for some number of purposes. And another reason why he used parables was to help us to remember the story. Basically, the stories stick in our minds. And when we read books or watch movies, um, those stories that we read uh, in, with interest and excitement, they tend to stick in our memory for a long time. You might not remember all the uh, details, but you might remember the stories. In fact, if you see something in story form, you might you tend to remember, in fact, more things than, than not. So that's why Jesus used parables to teach often important messages. And, and this parable deals with a very, in fact, most important issue in our life. In fact, um, you look at verse 14, it says, I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. It talks about justification. Justification by faith, to be more specific. And that is to receive salvation, to be saved to be accepted by God. And we know that there's nothing more important than that. So this morning, I was reading a devotion written by Charles Spurgeon, morning devotion for 28th of February, and he said that we can only find rest in God. And we need to look, in order to, in order to live our present life well, we need to look to the future, and that future is eternal future. 
And when you look to that eternal future, when you stand before the Lord, and the Lord might say to you, well done, faithful and good servant, inherit the kingdom prepared before the foundation of the world for you, then that's glorious moment. And that's the point we look towards. And that helps us to live our present time with eternal perspective and live our life well. And that's why it is important for us always to remember, for Christians, to think about our life in heaven through justification. It is almost as if that your one foot is in this world and your the other foot is in heaven. When the moment comes, we will all move in order to, to be with the Lord into eternal kingdom of God and be with the Lord forever. And that's what justification does. And that's more important than anything in this world, in this temporal world. We make plans for five years and ten years and for your retirement, but often people fail to make that eternal plan or plan for their eternity. For Christians, we know that our life in this world is only temporal, and we know that we are all going into eternal kingdom of God, and that's where we need to fix our eyes. This is really the most important issue in anyone's life. So Jesus begins the story, and he begins by telling them the characters who appear in the story. Two men, in verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. Let's think about just basic things. Who of the story? The two men. One Pharisee, another tax collector. Where is the story unfolding? In the temple. So they went up to the temple. They, you always go up to the temple. Uh, not only literally, because temple is a very, uh, it's a, a building with a um, very high platform. You actually climb up the steps. But also, metaphorically, you go up to temple because we go ascend. We go up and ascend into the Lord's God's presence. So you go up to temple. The two men went up to the temple. So where? The temple. And when is this? Most likely, one of their designated prayer time. Now, often... In Jesus' days, in Jerusalem, there was the temple, and they had morning prayer and afternoon prayer, early afternoon or late, sort of late afternoon or early evening prayer, about 3 p.m. or so. And those were the times when the daily sacrifices are made as well. So all these animals are brought, and priests slaughter these animals and give sacrifice offering to the Lord God for their forgiveness. So this is a time when many people come to the temple. And this is when... They come up to pray. And also, what are they doing? Prayer. Now they come up for prayer, as they did twice every day. How are they praying? We see that Pharisee is praying in a certain way. We'll look into that in more detail. And the tax collector is also praying in a certain way. And you might even ask why. Why are they praying? Why, why do they come up to the temple to pray? To be accepted by God to be received by God, or to be more specific, to be justified by God. So this is basically the story. They come to pray to God in the temple. The two men, let's have a look at the two men a little bit more in detail. Now one was a Pharisee, and who are the Pharisees? You know who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were basically a group of people about, you can say that they were the sort of religious sect of the people. They, they had about five to 6,000 in number at the time. Uh, and they began about a few hundred years before Jesus' time. Um, they began as very strict, what we might call separatists. Um, they said, we want to be different. We want to be separated from this world and separated to God. And they were very um, strict legalists. They follow the laws in the Bible, especially the law of Moses, and they lived literally their lives according to even the dot of the law. So we have very religious people um, and very uh, spiritual people. And often, a Pharisee would come from another Pharisee's family. So a Pharisee's son would have higher chance of becoming a Pharisee. It's almost like handing down that profession, sacred profession, uh, religious profession to their own sons. So uh, the Pharisee comes to the temple and they instantly know what kind of people um, they are and what kind of person this Pharisee would be. On the other hand, we have a tax collector, Pharisee and tax collector. 
and tax collector, as you also know, um, th they were actually on the other end of the social spectrum. You have a Pharisee who was very religious. A tax collector were the people who are not very trustworthy. In fact, they were so um, untrustworthy that they had no right to testify in the court of law in Jesus' days. And that's the kind of people um, you know, they were perceived to be. Tax collectors would often collect taxes or sometimes even extort money from their own fellow Israelites and give some of that to the Roman government, the occupier of the land, and take some for their own benefit. And they were regarded as traitors, basically, by the Jewish people. Um, they were not liked, not very popular. They had money uh, by some um, not proper means. They were not very scrupulous. Um, they, they did not really regard the law of Israel with any respect. Uh, they were not respected by people. So we have a religious person. You have a very secular person, on the other hand. You have a very self-righteous man and also a very sinful man. But this tax collector knows that he is sinful and he says, I am a sinner. He's asking for God's mercy as we shall see later. We have a loyalist who is loyal to their country and to the law of Moses. We have also, on the other hand, a traitor who betrays his own country and his own people. You have someone who is very honorable, a very venerable person, but on the other hand, we have a person who is despised and looked down by everyone else. You have a very respected person here. You've got a person who is looked down by everyone. You have someone with certain reputation, possibly over generations. You have someone, on the other hand, very devious, not honest. In the core, this Pharisee is holy in his own eyes, at least. Holy man. And you've got a filthy man, like a scum of the society. So you have the two people who, who would never really mix their lives each, with each other coming to the same place. It's quite a sight. In fact, these Pharisees were so holy, at least in their eyes, that they did not want to defile themselves in any way possible, spiritually and physically. They would not even touch anything that is unclean. They would make sure that their robes, their holy and clean robes, would not touch anything that is unclean. And if they did, um, they did defile themselves by any way, then they would go through certain strict rituals to actually cleanse and purify themselves um, as, as fast as they could. In fact, um, for a Pharisee, as he is now stepping up the steps into the temple, when he sees a tax collector, and you would recognize instantly this, this is a tax collector, uh, you know, by the way he is dressed and possibly because he's known to the people, you know, he's, he works for basically the Roman tax company, tax office, and then he extorts money from people so he would be known to the community. So as the Pharisee walks up and sees this tax collector, he's even thinking, why is he even here? And how dare he come to this holy place and defile the whole place? That, that's the kind of Pharisees um, he was. He comes up and sees the tax collector. And he separates himself from him. And he makes himself holy, undefiled in his own eyes. And he sets himself apart. In fact, um, look at verse 11. It says, the Pharisee stood by himself. You see that? The Pharisee stood by himself. And you can imagine quite likely that the Pharisee is getting a spot in the temple, um, possibly in the courtyard. Um, they possibly had a certain place reserved for them, sort of um, unofficially, but everybody knew that this is a place where Pharisees go and pray. Why? Well, a few reasons. It's a very highly visible place, most likely. And it's a place that's supposed to be clean from all the other people or things that could devour, like the tax collector. So he goes to this place and he stands by himself. This is the picture of him just being a Pharisee, being a very separatist and holy man. 
But nonetheless, he's standing in a place where he's highly visible by everyone else. It's kind of trying to um, take that place of um, sort of self-respect. He wants to be acknowledged, and he goes to the place where um, everybody can see and says, "Look, I'm here now. You know, I'm the Pharisee. I'm the holy man, and I pray to God." And he would pray most likely with his two hands up in the air, facing towards heaven and speaking to God. I was. Um, once I'm um, in India, in fact, I, I went to India many times and once we were walking the street in the marketplace and we saw some interesting man. A man who was um, sort of scantily dressed in orange rope. He had nothing else really, just rope and a few things like sticks and, and things. And, and he was sitting uh, in the marketplace in a very prominent place. And people, some, some people just walk past right by not even noticing, but some people would actually come before him and then, you know, do some... Know, bow and, and show your respect and some of them actually would give some money to this man's little tin um, that he had on the side. And I asked, you know, why, why is he there? You know, what, what is he or who is he? And they said, um, he's a holy, you know, Hindu holy man. And he said, um, or they said, the, the guide that we were with, um, our friend um, who was working there, said, um, well, he often comes here in the marketplace to actually um, ask for alms. Um, and, you know, he would be sitting in this place where there's a lot of traffic and people would see him. Um, and, and often that, that's not a kind of likely place for a holy man. But the reason why he comes here is to be seen by people and to be somehow respected and to ask for alms. So it's a little bit like that. It, it's, it's a kind of self-flaunting way. Um, you go to a place where you can be visible and you show to the people, look, I am a holy person. I am a holy man. The Pharisee was doing just that in the temple. And what better place than the temple to do that? Because temple is supposedly a place um, of these holy people who come to pray to God. So Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed. And notice in verse 11 how he prays. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I don't know how close he was to, to this tax collector, but it looks like that, at least in the story, the tax collector is not that far from the Pharisee. And you can imagine this tax collector kind of going like this. I, I, not, I thank you, Lord God, that I am not even like this tax collector, and trying to remove himself as much as he can from this you know, filthy man, not to be defiled by him, by his sin, and saying, I thank you, Lord God, I am clean and holy. And look, in verse 12, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. The only designated time for fasting, according to the law, was actually once a year before the Passover. But he says, I fast twice a week. Now, fasting twice a week was, was a practice that the Pharisees had developed. And it wasn't in the Bible necessarily, you could fast whenever you could, but there was no, no rule to say that you've got to fast twice a week. But he's doing that very faithfully, I'm sure. Um, and also he says, I give tenth of all I get. When they fasted, they also would um, uh, throw upon themselves all these ashes to tell people that I'm fasting. I'm not eating. So I'm hungry. I'm kind of winning of all these daily necessary things that I, that I can get uh, for the purpose of being holy and for the sake of God. Um, and often they would do that in the marketplace as well. Um, from other stories we can see that. So he says, look, I fast twice a week. Everybody knows that. Pharisees fast twice a week. Um, and I give tenth of all I get. All my income, I give tenth. That's also um, known as tithe. And, and tithe goes back even to Genesis but he's simply saying that I am faithful in giving my income, uh, a tenth of my income as offering as well. But notice also in verse 12, 11 and 12, in his prayer, can you actually go back to the prayer and count how many times he uses the word first pronoun I? I, thank you, that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And I fast twice a week. 
and give a tenth of all I get. At least four times. If you count, uh, you know, pronouns like me, maybe five times or even more. And how many times does he use the word God or any pronoun that refers to God? He says, God, I thank you. That's it. Even though he's praying to God, he's really saying the prayer to himself, isn't he? He's almost like in a self-boasting um, way, God, I thank you that I am like this. Just take a moment and think about this. Isn't this also how we sometimes pray? I mean, you know, we thank God, but even in thanking God, we can be subtly boasting ourselves. <clears throat> and especially to do that in the presence of others or in some public prayer would be even, even worse. And we do that often unknowingly, without knowing that we are doing this. And, and that's the nature that we have, a fallen nature. So this story is not just for this Pharisee or those people who are proud standing before Jesus at the time, 2,000 years ago, but this is for us as well. This is how, he's, how he prays. He prays in, in a somewhat very proud way. Now let's turn to the other prayer in verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance it looks like that the Pharisee was trying to get away from this tax collector who, who was not that far away. But the tax collector in his own mind knows that he's not supposed to be too close to the holy man like him. So he's kind of standing on far off, standing at a distance. And he is not even able to look up to heaven. He came up to the temple, but he's not able to look up. But he's now beating breast his chest and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. He makes reference to himself twice, me, sinner. That's a very stark contrast from the prayer that we saw in the Pharisee's prayer. He makes reference to himself four or five times, but this is all about something that he's done. Look, God, I do these things for you, and, I, and I'm not like those people. I am holy and I am good. This tax collector makes reference to himself, me, but nothing but a sinner. God have mercy on me. And that's his prayer. He's not even able to look up to heaven. And if you know anything about um, Jewish or Middle Eastern culture 2,000 years ago, the expression, there's one expression that here would stand out as not very fitting in the story. And that is to beat his breast, to beat his chest. Why? Well, let me explain. This is not something that you find commonly in men. Beating breast is an expression of extreme anguish. You're, you're so sad, your world has crumbled down and, and you're completely, absolutely flattened and then you beat your breast and you mourn, you mourn. This is, in fact, um, an often common expression of mothers who have lost their children. You see these mothers beating their breast and just mourning and crying out, even screaming to the top of their voice, just crying for that sad occasion, sad event that, that took place in their lives. And, and often women do this. The only other place that you find in the Bible where people do this is at the foot of the cross. Some women followed Jesus all the way to the cross. And when Jesus was crucified and breathed his last and gave up his spirit to God, when they confirmed that he was completely dead, the women beat their breast and they went home. This is often something that you find in funeral procession. But you don't find that men doing this. It's mostly women who have to do this. But here we see this tax collector, a man, 
who is beating his breast and saying to God. Now, unless you have to understand that, it's very easy to just read this and say, oh, he's repenting, he's regretful, uh, he's mourning for his sin. You can use all these adjectives to express and describe what he's like and what his mind is like, but you really have to understand it and see for yourself what it means to beat your breast and cry out to God to understand what he is saying and what he is doing. And the crowd who were listening to the story at the time knew it. Because they knew the culture, they lived in their culture. Beating breast, a man beating breast. I mean, how distraught he must have been to beat his breast and cry out to God and crying for God's mercy. He's showing his genuine humility, his true repentance. As that verse says in 1 Corinthians, he had the sorrow, godly sorrow, that produced repentance. Why? Because he was a sinner. And why? Because a sinner is under the judgment of God. Why? Because the judgment of God is too heavy for him to even imagine of bearing. The wrath of God, the indignation, eternal damnation. If you can really understand the gravity of the judgment of God, that's the natural, the only natural reaction that you would get from anyone. Often the reason why people don't believe in Christ is because they do not know that serious nature of God's judgment or the terrible fear of eternal hell. Of course, by the same token, they don't believe because they do not see the amazing glories of heaven either. They only see this world. They are short-sighted, but we who understand the Bible and the Word of God, not because we are clever, but because of God's grace, we are long-sighted in a sense. We, we can see things that are far away from us. In fact, if you were to just approach anyone in the street um, and ask them, so um, suppose that you believe in heaven and hell, how do, you, how do you get to heaven? How do you get justified? And the general perception is that good people would go to heaven. Good people. Of course, you can talk about you know, how good do you have to be and, and you can get into more detailed discussion, but general perception or common perception is that good people would go to heaven. And that's how we, you know, sort of as a society, would generally think. And just like that, in a very similar way, very similar way, nothing's really changed. In Jesus' days, the common perception for people was that people like Pharisees would be accepted by God. Good people, respected, revered people like Pharisees would go to God and be accepted into his kingdom. It's almost like, in, in today's terms, someone like a pastor, someone like a minister, surely would be accepted by God, you know, a holy person, a person who's right with God. And on the other hand, all these devious uh, criminals, especially the tax collector, uh, in this case would be someone like, I suppose you can say white collar criminals, you know, people who use their brains to do some huge crime and to have some gain uh, in a very sort of um, uh, in a legal way, not very legal, but legal somewhat, uh, and making all these profits for themselves. And you can see sort of you know, in a sarcastic way, you know, those people, you know, they deserve judgment. You know, they, they don't really deserve my respect. They're not really honorable people. You've got on one end, you know, religious leaders like uh, someone who's uh, leading a denomination or even churches, Christian organizations, very revered and respected person on the outside at least. And people think that those people go to heaven. But people who are so bad and evil, especially very devious, um, very um, coming up with all these schemes and, and swindling people, they may be rich and they may have power and authority, but you know, they wouldn't be accepted by God. That's how common people think. But we see in this story that Jesus is flipping that all together. Because in the end, in verse 14, he says, this man, the tax collector, was received by God, justified by God. 
and went home, not the other. The implication is that this tax collector was justified while the Pharisee was not justified, not accepted by God. You've got this sinner who's known as a sinner, a traitor, even a thug, someone who commands some possibly organized criminal gangsters. This man going to heaven, received by God. And on the other hand, this respected, blemish, you know, free person who's revered by the whole community is not accepted by God. And the reason, obviously, is because that's how the Pharisee appears on the surface, but underneath it's the same. Underneath, he's the same sinner, but covered up by all this hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. So you have, on one hand, a Pharisee, and the other end, you've got a tax collector. You've got the whole spectrum in between. It's almost like this. Um, if I could use this analogy, um, you've got a black paper underneath. The Pharisee would be cover, covering that black paper with um, layers of other decorations. Uh, you can imagine wrapping papers, um, gift papers, all these nice wrapping paper and decoration papers uh, with all kinds of beautiful uh, pictures and patterns and some of them even sort of you know, coming in a very velvet-like cloth finish. So you've got layers of that. So when you see from outside, you don't see the inside. You see the outside, the layers of hypocrisy. On the other hand, you have this tax collector who has nothing. So when you see this end, you see the black paper. In between are all kinds of people with various or varying degrees of layers of cover-up. People with just one cheap wrapping paper, cheap but still wrapping paper. And as you go toward this end, you have people with more papers and more wrappings to cover up what's really hidden inside. We know that the Bible says that God sees not our external forms, but He sees our inside. He sees our heart. Our, our heart that is desperately wicked and, and it is beyond cure, as Jeremiah says in chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. And there's nothing we can hide before God. When we stand before God, all these layers of hypocrisy will be stripped away and we will stand before Him as who we are. If you think about the spectrum, where would you be? I mean, where, where would you stand? And we'd all be somewhere in this spectrum. Some of, them, some of us may be closer to this end. Some of us may be closer to, to that end. But is there anyone who is like a tax collector who can just bear everything open and say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And we can see all these layers in these prayers. The Pharisee praying, listing the things that he has achieved. The tax collector simply saying that I am a sinner. I, I have nothing. I just need your mercy. He is reduced to a sinner. He humbles himself. On the other hand, the, the Pharisee is exalt, exalting himself. And as Jesus said, if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. The word humbled in verse uh, 14 is not used in a good sense. It is to be humiliated, basically. It is to be made of nothing. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you understand who you are and simply show before God as, as you are, then you will, be hum you will be exalted by God. You will be honored and justified by God. That's basically the story. Now in this story, as we've just learned, we've got the spectrum. And I asked you the question, where would you stand in this spectrum? And in this spectrum, we have the polar opposites, the Pharisee and the tax collector. And these two men could not be more different from one another. They had absolutely nothing in common including their eternal destiny. 
one would spend eternity in heaven in the presence of God and the other would, stand, the other would spend their, his eternity in eternal hell under the judgment of God forever. And you know who they are. You know which one's which. One would be in the kingdom of God but the other is excluded from the kingdom of God. And surely there's nothing in common between the two men. But at least, at least, as long as the story is still current, there is one common element between the two men. Yes, they shared nothing in common, but there was one thing in common. And what is that? It's the place where they are. The place where they are. And where are they? They're in the temple. They're in the temple. Metaphorically, they're in the presence of God where they can pray to God. They came for that purpose of praying. Although their prayers um, unraveled in very different ways, their desire to pray, you can say, is somewhat common. Of course, the real desire for the Pharisee was to boast himself, whereas the tax collector, tax collector is to ask for God's mercy. So you can say that that's different, but nonetheless, they're in the same place. The only common element between the two men is the place where they are. It's like what Jesus said from the parable of the wheat and tares. The wheat and tares all grow up in the same field. And the disciples, well, the, the servants come and say uh, to the master of the field, shall we pluck out all these tares? And um, Jesus said, no, just leave them, leave them until they grow. On the harvest day, they will be all separated. The tares will be burned, the wheat into the barn. Likewise, we all live in the same place, in the same world. And there are believers and there are unbelievers, all sort of mixed. But more narrowly speaking, more narrowly speaking, just as the, the Pharisee was in the temple and the tax collector was in the temple, we are all in the church. I mean, you're listening to me, if you're listening to this sermon live, you're listening to me because you're in the church. You may be in your place over Zoom, but you're in the church, the assembly of the saints. We have all gathered together to worship God, to pray to God. And all of us fall somewhere in that spectrum, from the Pharisee to the tax collector. And you would say, I guess I'll be about here, I'll be about here, I'll be closer to this end, and so on. But understand that the only tax collector would be justified. In other words, it doesn't matter where you stand, whether it's 10% or 20% or 30% or 100%, unless you become 0%, you wouldn't be justified. Unless we all become like this tax collector, you wouldn't be justified. And Jesus often said that in his parables, in his teachings, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, sarcastically, you wouldn't be entering into the kingdom of God. Meaning that you've got to be perfect. And the only perfection that we can, achieve, we can obtain is something that Christ achieved on the cross. Nothing that we've done. It's everything that Jesus has done. Like this Pharisee, if you come thinking that perhaps God will accept me because of something that I've done, you're greatly mistaken. But that's the general perception of the people. Good people go to heaven. Like Pharisees would go to heaven. And when they're hearing the story of Jesus at the time, their world is completely turned upside down. A, a Pharisee not justified, but this tax collector is justified. And, and they are numbed in their senses, in a sense. And I'm sure the story stuck in their memory. And I hope that this does stick in your memory as well, because this is what we're going to face on the judgment seat, on the judgment day of, of God, on that day when we stand before God, it will be found out. All these layers will be stripped out, stripped away, and you will stand as who you are. Thankfully for this, for this tax collector, he had the mercy of God. He was asking for God's mercy and it was given to him. He humbled himself. He was exalted. He was justified. Likewise, as I said before, 
We are all in the same place. And I, I'd love to think that we are all justified people, but they, that may not be the case, including people watching over camera. Some of us might be like this Pharisee, or some of us might be somewhere in between, but not coming all the way to the tax collector's position where we humble ourselves to complete and utter humility. And it's almost like you feel your rib cage is imploding and your heart is exploding and you've got this amazing sorrow and anguish that overtakes you and you've got nothing else to say to God but to say, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And only such people would be justified by God. No one else. If you bring even a shade of your own works that you think would be righteous or accepted by God and say, but God, I went to church. But God, I um, served in this ministry. But God, I, I gave offerings and I contributed to the church ministry. Not a lot, but I did some. Jesus might say to you, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. And that story in Matthew chapter 7, people who come, and when Jesus said to these people, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, these were the people who said, Look, we, we've done all these things for you. We taught in, in the streets with you, and we ate in your presence. We spoke in your name. They did all these things, and yet they were cast out into the outer darkness. And that's what will happen to those people who come with their own self-righteousness, isn't it? So this is the story for us, for every one of us. And it is my prayer, and I'm sure it will be your prayer, that we all would understand that we are like this tax collector, and all we can ask for from God is God's mercy and nothing else, so that we might be justified in God's sight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time this morning in your word and we thank you for this, uh, such a striking story. When we put this story in its original, original context and we look at this story from the original viewers, original audience's lens, uh, we, we can feel the gravity of the story somewhat. But it is our prayer that we can really feel the full weight of this teaching as we meditate upon this in our time and pray Lord really earnestly that we would all be accepted and justified by God because we come to you asking for your mercy and nothing else and for those people who are accepted by God and who are justified in your sight we pray for your continuing grace so that we can grow in our faith and continue to serve you but even when it comes to serving you and our ministry, we know that this is all by your mercy and grace and nothing that we bring to our lives. So even for that, we thank you. But we thank you genuinely and humbly because of all that you've done for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.